Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's virtual book club. I'm Robert Newman, President and Director of the National Humanities Center, and your host for this evening's event. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that you'll need to log in to participate in the discussion. You can do that by clicking on the blue sign in button in the upper right hand corner of the page using your Gmail account. This evening is the final event in the series of virtual book club gatherings. And I want to thank all of you who have been joining us and talking with scholars about the history and the dynamics of racial oppression in the United States. I also want to thank the sponsors of our virtual book club series, the Leadership Council of Aging Organizations, Duke University, the Federation of State Humanities Councils, the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, the Furman Humanities Center, and Osher Lifelong Learning Institutes at Arizona State University, Duke, Furman, North Carolina State University, and the University of Michigan. Our guest this evening is Martha S. Jones, the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor and Professor of History at Johns Hopkins University. Originally trained as a lawyer at the City University of New York, Martha Jones spent her early career representing the homeless, people with mental illness, and women living with HIV and AIDS. But inspired by historians like Eric Foner and the late Manning Marable, Martha decided to pursue a career that combined scholarship and social justice, earning her PhD in history from Columbia. Her first book, All Bound Up Together, The Woman Question in African-American Public Culture, 1830 to 1900, examined Black debates about women's rights and led to her co-edited volume with historian Mia Bay toward an intellectual history of Black women. Martha has received numerous fellowships in support of her work, including a fellowship at the National Humanities Center in 2013-14, when she was conducting work on her book on the history of the 14th Amendment, Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America. In 2017, Martha joined the faculty at Johns Hopkins University, and she was recently selected to lead a campus-wide initiative examining the history of discrimination at the university. This evening, she has graciously agreed to talk with us about her new book, Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. The book will be published in just a couple of weeks. Martha's appearance with us is particularly timely as it coincides with the anniversary of the ratification and the adoption of the 19th Amendment 100 years ago this week. Please join me in welcoming Professor Martha Jones. Martha. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, I really appreciate you um, for the kind introduction. And thanks to you and everybody at the National Humanities Center for having me um, back. Um, as you mentioned, I was a fellow at the center in 2013, 2014. Um, before we went live, I was explaining that in my household, we still refer to that as the best year of our lives. Um, I can't say enough about the center, um, its commitment to our humanistic scholarship, um, but also its commitment to us as individual scholars. Um, and so uh, I owe a great deal of debt um, to the center and uh, very happy to be back with you, even um, under these virtual circumstances. So thank you so much. I do want to talk um, with you all this evening about uh, my new book, uh, Vanguard. And um, it is no mistake that I am publishing a book that looks at 200 years of African-American women's political history with a focus on the question of voting rights. Um, there's no mistake that I'm publishing it here um, in uh, 2020. Um, as Robert suggested, um, this project began in part because I was inspired in a sense by the impending anniversary 
um, I had begun to get a sense of the kinds of um, commemorations and celebrations that would be uh, part of this anniversary summer. And I wanted to be certain um, that anyone who was interested in this subject had the opportunity to appreciate historically uh, the role, the position, the ideas, the activism of African-American women in the long struggle for voting rights. And I also wanted to bring um, into one book as best I could um, what I think of as three generations of um, African-American women's uh, historian's work. Um, so this is a book that very much stands on the shoulders, as we say, of um, the many, many scholars who have come before me. Um, I'll mention one in particular, um, Harvard University's Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, because one of the pleasures of my years, uh, in my year at the National Humanities Center was sharing it with Professor Higginbotham as a lunch partner and interlocutor and more. Um, it really was such a generative year in more ways than I can say. So I was inspired to write this book in part because we were entering this anniversary year and I wanted to be able to um, introduce um, many kinds of readers to the sorts of histories that Professor Hagenbotham and I and so many others have been working on over many decades. I also had the um, suspicion that it would take some work to ensure that African-American women would be a part, a key part of the conversations around this anniversary moment. Some of you may recall that it was not so long ago that in the city of New York, in that city's iconic Central Park, that a monument was proposed to be installed that would honor the early history of women's suffrage. Uh, and when the plans were unveiled, um, there were two figures who uh, would, uh, were proposed to sit on that monument. And probably you've heard their names before. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony were proposed to represent, if you will, the whole of the history of women's suffrage. And I began to wonder um, and really think quite critically about that gesture, about that statement, about that representation of the history. Where were African-American women? Um, I was among those who asked that question. Um, I myself did some uh, op-ed writing um, in that season to encourage um, the designers to consider um, another uh, suffragist from New York State, um, Sojourner Truth, um, the former the enslaved woman advocate uh, for women's rights, anti-slavery activist. Um, and today um, we are getting ready to unveil that monument and indeed will include Sojourner Truth. But that was a lesson to me in that if African-American women were going to be part of this story, um, it was going to require um, some revision in the best sense of the word. I also was wanting to build on the uh, pathbreaking work um, done by Dr. Rosalind Turborg Penn, who as early as the 1970s was beginning to do work that recovered the, uh, the lives, the ideas, the activism of African-American women um, in the movement for the 19th Amendment. Dr. Turborg Penn looked beyond some of the standard histories, went beyond many of the uh, typical artifacts, evidence that we had used to write those histories, um, to write an entirely new story of Black women, particularly on the road to the 19th Amendment. Um, my work very much stands on her shoulders and is a tribute to her pioneering work. The last thing that happened was by happenstance, as far as I know, um, I got invited to be part of a project at the uh, Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery, which was planning for an exhibition um, uh, called Votes for Women, Portraits of Persistence, and you can visit it online today. Kate LeMay was the curator and she approached me and asked if I would write an essay for that um, catalog that the National Portrait Gallery was going to publish. I thought about it 
for about 30 seconds. Um, and then I said yes, because um, I knew um, the sort of um, seriousness and firepower that the, histor uh, the Smithsonian and the National Portrait Gallery would bring to the project. And it was a chance for me to really try and think through and write through the long history of Black women's activism. Um, that essay um, is very much at the heart of Vanguard and the heart of my remarks today. I tell you all this um, as a way to pull back the curtain, if you will, on how historians work. Um, I have written many different kinds of books, um, but always um, I am inspired um, by the opportunity to not only uh, tell good and oftentimes new histories, um, but also to bring um, in particular African-American history to bear on um, questions and issues that are preoccupying us in the 21st century. As I'll mention at the end of my talk this evening, um, Vanguard has certainly turned out to be a book um, that is situated at the crossroads between um, the important uh, uprisings in our um, cities across America when it comes to questions of racial justice and this anniversary of the 19th Amendment, along with very real concerns about the state of voting rights in the United States as we move toward a November election. So I am um, really honored that the women um, in Vanguard are helping to shed some light on our very own moment. So I wanna talk a little bit about what I learned um, in writing 200 years of African-American women's uh, history on the vote. Um, and as Robert suggests, in some ways, um, I was able to return to early work I had done even in my doctoral dissertation um, to rethink some of my um, earliest um, ideas about African-American women's politics. Um, and part of what became clear is that I was going to have to, um, if you will, challenge some myths because much of what we um, come to think of as our common sense about the history of women's suffrage, um, oftentimes, too often perhaps, veers um, off the historical track and into some uh, myths, some generalizations um, that really needed addressing. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the places in which my history intersects with histories you might be familiar with um, as a way of suggesting how the perspective of African-American women on the history of voting rights shifts our lens and shifts our understanding. The first place to start is um, Seneca Falls, New York um, in the summer of 1848 when a small group of women and some men um, gathered in the Wesleyan Methodist Chapel there um, to talk about the rights of women and to memorialize their demands in a declaration of sentiments. Um, there, um, we know that Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, was not alone, but she was in the minority initially when she wanted to include a demand for women's political rights, a demand for the votes on that declaration of sentiments, and that she was indeed aided by Frederick Douglass, um, the abolitionist and journalist who had come to Seneca Falls from nearby Rochester. Now, historian Lisa Tetro um, has done important work on um, helping to contextualize Seneca Falls to teach us that it's not quite the beginning of the movement that we once thought it was, um, that it was a small and local gathering in which women worked on some very important ideas. But when I visited or revisited Seneca Falls, my question was, what about African-American women? Um, were they there? What were they thinking about in the summer of 1848? And one of the things I knew from Dr. Turborg Penn's work is that, as best we know, there were no African-American women present at the Seneca Falls meeting. Um, there certainly were women in the local community who might have attended, um, but they did not. And they are not on record as weighing in on the kinds of questions that were animated there. So part of what has shaped my research here is to ask, so where were black women if they weren't at the Seneca Falls meeting? And part of what I discover is that rather than gathering there in upstate New York, African-American women had organized and gathered 
the prior spring in May of 1848 in the city of Philadelphia. Why were they there? It was the every four year general conference of the African Methodist Episcopal Church that was gathering in Philadelphia. And black women affiliated with the AME Church came to that city, to that meeting to talk about their rights. What is it that they're after? They come to the AME Church because they would like black women to have preaching licenses, to be authorized, to preach the gospel, to travel on the itinerant minister's circuit, and to lead um, their denomination when it comes to critical ideas about the ways in which faith and politics intersect um, in an institution like the AME Church. The women organize, they get themselves a male ally who takes their petition to the floor of the convention. And before the deliberations are finished, they have won preaching licenses in the AME church. Now the church might sound like a funny place to look for the start of a story about women's voting rights. But what I can tell you is that the ideas that were generated there, some of the women who are critical to that campaign, um, and most importantly, the crystallization of black women's critique of sexism along with racism in their public lives is one that will emanate out of that church into anti-slavery societies, into African-American political conventions and more. Um, it is one of the birthplaces of the movement that African-American women build ultimately in the campaign toward the 19th Amendment. If Seneca Falls is a moment that's familiar to you, I'll hope that you've also encountered some histories of the period immediately following the Civil War. Here we are in the 1860s, slavery has been abolished by the 13th Amendment. Congress is beginning to debate questions like citizenship and the rights that follow citizenship for black Americans, including political rights like the vote. An old coalition, a little one that is connected to that meeting in Seneca Falls, as well as to that meeting in Philadelphia in 1848, an old coalition um, comes together um, at the war's end in 1866 under the auspices of the American Equal Rights Association. And they will begin to debate the future of American politics and the question of universal voting rights and falling short of that, what it means for some in that coalition to win voting rights in the 1860s and others to be left behind. Now, if you've heard the, ever heard this story of these debates, you've likely heard it told as a standoff between Elizabeth Cady Stanton on the one hand, who advocates educated suffrage, which is a sort of code for the voting rights of educated white women you hear the story of her standing off against Frederick Douglass, who advocates that the coalition support black men's voting rights. And Douglass's argument is that for African American men, voting rights are a matter of life and death in the 1860s. What about African American women? Oftentimes, the telling of this story elides or leaves out altogether the black women who were part also of these conventions, of these deliberations, of these debates about the future of voting rights. Um, women like Sojourner Truth, the anti-slavery advocate, abolitionist, um, and women's rights advocate. Um, but I want to draw our attention to another woman who was there, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Frances Harper had been a uh, teacher she was a poet of some repute. She was an anti-slavery lecturer of um, great success in the 1850s. And she too is with Stanton, um, with Susan Anthony, Frederick Douglass, Wendell Phillips, and the many others who gather in the 1860s to debate their political futures. And I introduce her because it turns out that there is, if you will, a third position um, in these debates about voting rights. And it is represented um, beautifully by Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who is oftentimes invoked for um, one of her remarks there. She says to the gathering, 
Um, we are all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity. What does she mean by this? She means to urge her compatriots, um, those who have toiled with her in radical politics before the war, not to lose their sight of the universal, the universal aspirations of their movement, not to become mired down in differences um, rooted in sex, differences rooted in race. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper urges this coalition to reject both racism and sexism in American politics. And we know, of course, that she does not succeed. By the end of the 1860s, this coalition will split. But for the purposes of Vanguard, she's a critical um, thinker because Watkins Harper is someone who is developing and working through a philosophy that black women will not only invent, um, they will promote, they will push, they will work by way of um, all the way through to, I'll say, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. This vision that the bar for the United States, the bar for our political culture is so high um, that it must be held at a place where neither racism nor sexism have any influence. Oftentimes when I say that to my students, they think the, that those principles are 21st century principles. But part of what um, Vanguard is able to teach us is the way in which black women had been working on this view um, for many decades by the time we get to the 1860s. And they are alone um, in these early um, moments of the women's movement. They are alone in promoting this universalistic approach to voting rights one that, as I said, rejects racism and sexism. A last small vignette in our story um, I want to tell through the life of um, a woman named Hallie Quinn Brown. Now, if Hallie Quinn Brown is not a household name, um, part of what I aim to do in Vanguard is expand um, our um, our household names when it comes to the history of women's suffrage. And I hope Hallie Quinn Brown is someone that you'll remember. Hallie Quinn Brown was born in 1849 in Pennsylvania. She was born into a free family, not enslaved, but the pressures, racism and uh, more colonization, black laws in the United States lead her family to migrate to Canada, along with many other dissident African-Americans who before the Civil War believe that the US will never acknowledge them as citizens, will never extend to them full rights. Hallie Quinn Brown, though, after the Civil War, um, after the Constitution has been amended to abolish slavery, make Black American citizens, and even to help shore up the voting rights of African American men, Hallie Quinn Brown returns to the US, is educated at Wilberforce University, a historically Black college in Ohio, and she will go on to an extraordinary career. She will begin her political life in the AME church, not unlike those women in 1848, where she will run to, uh, for office. She will look to head the Board of Education and the educational efforts of the AME church. And there will be some rousing speeches and debates, even in the 1870s when she runs, about whether or not women are suited to hold this sort of office in her church community is an extension of these old debates from the 1870s. She will be trained as an elocutionist at the Chautauqua Institute, uh, institution, um, and she'll take great pride in her four years, four summers at Chautauqua, where elocution will, um, her training in elocution will launch Hallie Quinn Brown um, into a whole new career, a public life now, a speaker, an influencer, as we'd say in the 21st century, someone who's looking to change minds. By the 1890s, when uh, white women are founding organizations like the American, uh, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, Hallie Quinn Brown and other African American women are on the ground founding a companion organization, the National Association of Colored Women. Here, African American women give birth to their own suffrage association and more. Um, this will be the central political uh, home for African American women activists like Hallie Quinn Brown, all the way um, to the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. 
Hallie Quinn Brown um, will hold many offices in the National Association of Colored Women. Most notably for our conversation, she will um, inaugurate their suffrage department and bring that association firmly into the struggle for women's votes that is um, that is waged um, in the first two decades of the 20th century. Um, and by 1920, the year that the 19th Amendment is ratified, Hallie Quinn Brown is president of the National Association of Colored Women. It is a difficult moment in the history of Brown's politics and her suffrage politics. It is a difficult moment for the NACW because what women like Hallie Quinn Brown know as the 19th Amendment uh, if you will, travels the country in its ratification campaign, what they know is that the 19th Amendment, for all of its promise, promises nothing to those African-American women who live in states where African-Americans, Black Americans are disenfranchised by Jim Crow laws. Hallie Quinn Brown knows that even after ratification of a federal amendment, the individual states will be wholly at liberty to enact laws, poll taxes, to enforce laws, poll taxes, literacy tests, understanding tests, and more. They will be at liberty to use those devices to keep African-American women from the polls, just as African-American men have been kept from the polls since the 1890s by these devices. It is a difficult moment because Hallie Quinn Brown must already be at work on the next phase of the voting rights movement, the next campaign for women's voting rights, and it will be one that goes to defeating Jim Crow. One of the first things Hallie Quinn Brown does in the winter of 1921 after the 19th Amendment has been ratified is um, reach out to Alice Paul, head of the National Women's Party, and one of the figures along with Chari, Carrie Chapman Catt, one of the figures who is most associated with the successful campaign um, that wins ratification of the 19th Amendment. Hallie Quinn Brown goes to Alice Paul, and what she's looking for is support now for federal legislation, that is laws coming out of Congress that would give teeth to the 19th Amendment, that would use the 19th Amendment to create federal legislation that would defeat the Jim Crow laws that otherwise are going to keep Black women from the polls. Hallie Quinn Brown knows that the 19th Amendment alone won't do that, that it needs now federal legislation. And she goes to Alice Paul to ask Paul and the National Women's Party to link arms with African-American women in the National Association of Colored Women and to uh, continue the work to win all American women voting rights. She calls on Alice Paul um, on the eve of what regretfully um, for Ali Quinn Brown is the last convention of the National Women's Party. And what we know is that before that meeting is done, um, Alice Paul and the National Women's Party leadership has decided to fold up shop. Um, they uh, declare victory in the 19th Amendment and um, Alice Paul will move on um, to importantly by 1923 um, become the key proponent of the Equal Rights Amendment. But this means, of course, that women like Hallie Quinn Brown are, um, if you will, left behind, um, left to defy um, a new campaign for voting rights. Um, black women in the NACW will do just that, along with black church women, um, along with um, black activist women in colleges and universities in sororities and more. Um, they will link arms now with African-American men who also suffer under a regime of voter suppression um, in 1920 and begin on the long, um, difficult, dangerous road 
to uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. When I began the work on Vanguard and to recover the story of women like Hallie Quinn Brown, I was, well, I assumed I would end the story in 1920 with ratification of the 19th Amendment. And my brilliant editor at Basic Books, I'll give him credit, Brian Distelberg, a historian himself, um, said to me, I'm not sure that's right, Martha. I think you may have to come um, all the way up to the present before you're done. And then he left me to do my work. And I, I knew what Brian meant, um, but it hadn't quite sunk in um, that in fact, if I left the story at the 19th Amendment, I was really truncating and selling short the extraordinary history of Black women in the struggle for voting rights in the United States. One of um, the things uh, you should know about me is that I work um, at home in an office um, with portraits of um, the women on my fam of my family hanging on the wall. Um, I think of myself um, accountable um, to them oftentimes as I'm doing my research and my writing. Um, and among those portraits is a portrait of my grandmother, Susie Jones. And as I was finishing Vanguard, I realized that um, somewhat self-consciously um, that I didn't know Susie Jones's story, um, that I didn't know my own grandmother's story about um, the vote. I didn't know if she had voted in 1920. She was a young um, mother living in St. Louis, Missouri. And so um, I determined before I would finish the book um, that I would um, take a detour from my research to see if I could discover um, her um, story of voting rights. So I'll end with just a bit from that. Um, I started, as I said, in St. Louis, Missouri, um, where my grandmother was um, living. Um, she was a new mother with two small children. Um, and while I could figure out where she lived and sort of what her family -like life looked like, um, I could never discover um, anything about her political life in these years. But I did find her mother, Fanny Williams, there in St. Louis, a member of that city's Phyllis Wheatley YWCA, and someone who in 1919 and 1920 ran a suffrage school that looked to train African-American women to prepare them for the ratification of the 19th Amendment and to equip them to overcome the kinds of hurdles that local voting officials in St. Louis were sure to lay in their path. Um, women in the Phyllis Wheatley Y taught one another how to pay poll taxes, how to pass literacy tests, how to pass understanding clauses, uh, understanding tests. Um, and so Susie's mother, I learned, was a suffragist, um, but I really wasn't sure about Susie herself. I followed her um, and the path led me to a place that I knew well, which is Greensboro, North Carolina, um, not too far uh, west from where the National Humanities Center um, sits. And it turns out in that year I sent at the, spent at the center, um, the family history digging that I did um, made its way into the pages of Vanguard. What did I learn? Um, I learned a couple of things. One, um, I spent time at the North Carolina State Archives, thinking that there I would find um, the voting rolls, the registers, maybe I would even find the ballots and I would be able to recover Susie's history and the history of other African-American women as they tried and perhaps succeeded in coming to the polls in 1926, the year that Susie moved to Greensboro. But it turns out that those records haven't survived. And that is part of the challenge of telling the history of African-American women in the vote. Um, that some of the records that would permit us to tell those stories with great deta detail, with great precision, have not survived. And we're left um, to news reports and generalities. Um, but I still can't tell you even today if Susie voted. Now, some of you know that the city of Greensboro, however, is a fabled place in um, American history. Um, if 
not for many things, if for certainly for the history of student activ activism in the modern civil rights movement um, and the young people who sit in at that city's Woolworths in an effort to further the cause of desegregating public accommodations in North Carolina and in the United States generally. Susie is in Greensboro in those years, along with her husband, David, because they uh, together lead Bennett College, which is a liberal arts institution for African-American women in that city. And I was very lucky to discover um, an oral history that Susie gave back in 1978 to historian Bill Chafe um, of Duke University as he was writing his history of civil rights in Greensboro, civilities and civil rights. In that interview she gave to Bill Chafe, Susie Jones recounts in some detail what it was like to work on voting rights in the 1950s and 1960s in Greensboro. She recounts how the young women in her charge at Bennett College organize to knock on doors, to instruct folks in how to register, to accompany them to the polls, how they do that nitty gritty, dangerous but essential work um, that was required in so many black communities across the South in those years in order to um, break the hold that disfranchisement had on Black Americans and to bring um, the advent of um, a new history, a new moment in voting rights, the very hard won Voting Rights Act of 1965. As Susie recounted um, to Bill Chafe, um, she says, it was thrilling. And it was an evidence for how education and the project of American democracy were companions. And ed that educated young women like those at Bennett were obliged to work then in the trenches and to make sure that voting rights came to all black Americans in this modern civil rights era. Um, for Susie, this was thrilling. But for me, Yes, it was thrilling to find her there and to finally discover an important chapter in her story about voting rights. But as important, it was, it turned out to be a key insight, um, one that really bore out the suggestion from my editor, Brian Distelberg, um, the suggestion he had made to me many months before that if I was going to write the history of African American women and voting rights, I was going to have to set aside. Um, old ideas about a movement that went from Seneca Falls to the 19th Amendment, um, old ideas that said all American women won the vote in 1920. And I was going to have to follow Black women to the many places where they waged the um, campaign for voting rights, like the National Association of Colored Women and like Bennett College. Um, it turned out that Susie Jones, like her mother, um, did run a suffrage school, um, but it was a historically black women's college in Greensboro, North Carolina. And for me, it was remarkably thrilling to find her there. So I think with that, if it's all right with Robert, I'll wrap up. I'm happy to talk more about Vanguard and of course to talk more about what um, writing and um, publishing a book on this topic has meant um, in our own time um, at the intersection of 21st century voter suppression, the demand for uh, the Black Lives Matter, and um, of course, um, this centenary of the 19th Amendment. But I thank you all for joining me this evening, and I very much look forward to the questions and to more discussion. Thank you so much, Professor Martha Jones, uh, for a wonderfully multi-layered and indeed moving presentation. Um, we have people uh, attending from all over the country and Canada. Uh, we have folks from Ontario, New York, California, Florida, Texas, Ohio, and a number of other places as well. Um, let me start with a question. I, I, I was really taken by the family history that you that you presented. I, I wonder if you could talk to us about um, any interviews you might have done with descendants of any of the heroines that you studied. Um, I am 
I'll confess that I'm a 19th century historian by training, um, and I lean heavily on um, oral historians um, like Bill Chafe, um, like Mers Tate, um, who had interviewed um, not only my grandmother, but many um, African-American women of her generation as part of Harvard University's Schlesinger Library collection, the Black Women's Oral History Project. Um, so I benefited greatly from um, the courageous and expert oral historians who came before me. Um, though I will say um, one of the great honors in doing this work has been, uh, has been to come to know um, Michelle Duster, who some of uh, you, uh, you may recognize her name. Uh, Michelle Duster is um, an intellectual, an activist, um, a writer, and also the great granddaughter of Ida B. Wells. Um, and so um, uh, talking with Michelle, um, hearing her perspective on Ida B. Wells, um, both as uh, a, a historian, um, but also as a descendant, um, really, frankly, gave me the courage um, not only to explore my family history, that's something I love to do and will do the rest of my days, but Michelle Duster really gave me the courage, um, the backbone, um, not only to do that research, but to write about it, to publish it, um, to begin uh, a historical book um, with um, a word like I. Um, and so I'm deeply indebted to Michelle, um, her work on Ida Wells. She has a new book coming out this winter um, about her great grandmother, um, but her, mo her model, um, which is to encourage us both to be um, rigorous in our research, um, but not to shy away from the ways in which um, our research also runs through our very um, personal lives. We have a question um, about uh, asking you to talk a bit more about the legacies of these women in the realm of political organizing and activism beyond the struggle to obtain the franchise. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think one of the things that is remarkable about the story I tell in Vanguard is that um, if we follow the organizations, the institutions, the networks that Black women built over two centuries, we discover that those networks are still active today and result in Black women, for example, turning out at the polls in uh, percentage-wise more so than any other American demographic. Um, so what do I mean? That still today, African-American women are organizing in YWCAs. They are organizing in AME church basements. They are organizing through sororities. Um, they are organizing um, through the National Association of Colored Women, the National Council of Negro Women. Um, these are old organizations built by Black women over many centuries, and they turn out to be the key to understanding the power of African-American women um, at the ballot box um, even today. Um, I would say, for example, um, the election of um, the Democrat, Doug Jones, um, to the US Senate in 2017, and a, a very close race um, in which African-American women turned out disproportionately, and then 98% of them voted for Doug Jones, resulted in the flipping of that Senate seat from red to blue. Um, and it was a testament to those institutions, those old, venerable, essential institutions where African-American women organized and got one another to the polls in 2017. The legacy is very real, very palpable in our own time. Another questioner asks, were there any black women in the mid 19th century who like some white women opposed fighting for suffrage? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I don't discover outright anti-suffragists among African-American women. Um, though I'd certainly be interested if other research reveals that there were um, anti-suffragists um, among Black women in this period. But I do discover debates among and between Black women, um, most notably between uh, Mary Church Terrell, um, a Washingtonian um, and president of the National Association of Colored Women, the first president, and 
um, Mrs. Booker T. Washington of Tuskegee, Alabama, Margaret Murray Washington, a subsequent president. And these two women really disagree. Terrell is a full on um, radical suffragist and encourages black wem women to use every tactic at their disposal to win the vote. Um, Washington takes another view. She believes that if black women are too strident, if they are too radical, if they follow, for example, Alice Paul, as she organizes women's parades and later um, the picketing of the White House, um, Washington worries that African-American women will pay a particular sort of price um, reputationally um, that white women may not in fact pay, that black women are more vulnerable in the public sphere um, to ridicule, to denigration, and even to violence. And so these two women debate the question of tactics and how um, deeply black women should step into the suffrage fight. But even Margaret Murray Washington is going to organize suffrage schools and citizenship schools and encourage African-American women to be ready so that when a 19th Amendment is finally ratified, that they are prepared to exercise their full rights as citizens. So disagreements, but not quite an anti-suffrage, suffrage disagreement. Can you speak a bit more about the role uh, pre-1848 and the cross-section between abolitionist and women's activism. And this questioner also asks, why is pre-1848 history uh, so underrepresented? Well, thank you for that question. As someone who works on pre-1848, I think the history of the early Republic is essential and important. Um, I'll say to you, you can't understand the history of women's uh, voting rights and the 19th Amendment if you don't understand, for example, um, the terms that um, set the U.S. Constitution, uh, which is silent about voting rights um, in the early republic. Um, you can't understand um, how federalism as instantiated in the U.S. Constitution um, defers to the individual states to determine who votes and by what terms such that we always until today live in a patchwork nation where voting rights are uneven um, depending on where you live and who you are. Um, so yes to that early history. But more to your question, um, I begin Vanguard in the 1820s because what I see long before meetings like Seneca Falls or the women's conventions of the 1850s is the necessity for African-American women, first, if you will, to develop a critique a political philosophy that will undergird, that will rationalize, um, that will articulate why it is that they believe political rights, including the vote, are essential for Black women. And what I discover are some remarkable singular figures. Jarena Lee, a Black Methodist preacher, uh, Mariah Miller Stewart, um, a civil rights activist in Boston, uh, Sarah Maps Douglas, a literary society organizer in the city of Philadelphia, all of them by the 1820s and 1830s are using the pulpit, the podium, and the pen to set out the terms of a political philosophy that we heard tonight echoed by Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. These are all women who say we have deep concerns about our communities, about the nation, about democracy. Um, from our position, it appears that the way forward is through the elimination of racism and sexism. Even decades before Seneca Falls, African-American women are forging this perspective, and it's one that will take them, um, I'd say, all the way through to the 21st century. Thank you for that. Uh, we have another question. Who uh, This questioner is intrigued by uh, your presentation about the role of the AME church in uh, your history and asks, maybe we look to the churches today to combat disenfranchisement. Absolutely. Um, you know, take a peek in a church basement um, the weeks and months um, before an election um, and you will find um, African-American women and men um, still at work, 
voter education, voter registration, voter turnout. Um, the AME Church is one of many religious communities that are essential to the um, African American politics um, even today. Um, I'll point out that while the struggles in that church begin with some fundamental questions, can women have preaching licenses? Um, can they be ordained to the ministry? These are questions that occupy the 19th century. Those questions continue into the 20th century. Um, but I'm pleased to say um, that today in the AME Church, um, women um, sit in the um, highest office uh, within that denomination, elected there by men and women in that denomination, um, Bishop Vashti McKenzie, um, the very first um, woman to be ordained as a bishop in the AME Church, um, an active, dynamic woman um, who very much speaks to both the spiritual and the political concerns of her denomination and, and its um, community across the country. Um, I commend Bishop McKenzie to you as an example of someone who inherits the work of a woman like Jarena Lee, um, embodies that political philosophy um, that says um, neither race nor sex should keep um, Americans, including Black women, um, from critical leadership. Um, Bishop McKenzie really embodies that. I wonder if you could talk a bit to um, those in our audience who are not historians or scholars uh, about the importance of working in archives and uh, your, your own experience that perhaps uh, present uh, an amazing discovery you, you had uh, as a result of working in archives. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've already mentioned this search for my grandmother and um, I want to underscore that um, as historians, um, the histories we tell um, very much depend on um, archivists, on librarians, on curators. Of uh, We depend on institutions um, to keep, to honor, to preserve, and to make um, materials from the past available. Um, so my hat's off to um, every of uh, many dozens of repositories I relied upon when writing Vanguard. Um, but there are disappointments because um, for too long in the history of our country, African-American women in many places, with some notable exceptions, um, in many places, African-American women were not regarded as um, the subjects of historical inquiry, of historical study. Um, and so we treasure um, the slim records that have survived. I'm really indebted to Black women themselves, those going back to the early 19th century, like Jarena Lee, who pens her own memoir and leaves her own record, even when um, no one else much um, appears to value that record, Jarena Lee makes her own record. And this is true for many of the women I write about in the 19th century, who are sure to use the paper and the pen, um, the book, the pamphlet, the tract um, to tell their own stories. I'll tell you the most remarkable discovery of all for me. Um, I am someone who, prior to writing this book, had worked almost exclusively um, in the 19th century, in early America, where, um, as I've suggested, the records um, for African-American women are uh, rich but thin. And then I began to ask questions about the 20th century um, and discovered um, that, in fact, um, there really is a different sort of archival record um, that characterizes the 20th century. Black women are organized. They understand themselves to be um, the uh, worthy subjects of historical inquiry. They work in collaboration with important institutions like um, Howard University's Moreland Spingarn Library um, to preserve their papers. Um, when I got to the 20th century, I was overwhelmed um, by the collections at places like Howard, um, at Harvard University's uh, Schlesinger Library, at the Radcliffe Institute, um, and many other places. 
Um, I benefited from projects at places like the Library of Congress, where um, the papers of key figures in my story have been digitized and um, can be accessed by folks um, even in the time of COVID um, from their home computers. Um, but there's no question that that work continues. Um, part of the reason I shared my grandmother's story um, was to plant a seed um, that might inspire others to interview the elders in their family, to write their stories down, to preserve those stories, both for your own family's um, pleasure, um, but also um, for the historical record. Um, and so I'll make that pitch again, which is to say um, we today um, are in a position to create our own archives, to value those um, uh, histories that we think are important. Um, and so I hope um, that in addition to hanging on to every diary and letter and whatever else might be in that box in your attic, um, that you also take these times and close quarters um, to interview the elders in your family and learn something about um, their story of voting rights. Um, those are stories that are valuable to all of us. So tonight, uh, Kamala Harris is going to be accepting the vice presidential nomination for the Democratic Party. Do you see it, this as a kind of culmination of the history that you're presenting, or is it dangerous to think that way? It is without question um, a sort of culmination of the history I have written. Now, I did not know Senator Harris's fate when I was finishing Vanguard, but what I knew as I was finishing this book is that it was really, we are ready to, um, set aside um, the sort of distinction that would mark Senator Harris as a first. She is a first. She has been a first in many aspects of her professional life. And still, I think what Vanguard demonstrates is that here in 2020, African-American women in politics are a force. Why do I say that? Um, precisely because it is across generations of black women's activism that the foundation is laid for figures like Senator Harris, yes. But what we know about 2020 and Vice President Biden's um, quest for a running mate was that there wasn't one black woman on that list or two or three or four there were six African-American women on that list. And that is a reflection of a generation of black women who have prepared themselves for this moment, who were ready to step into history when history opened the door to their um, opportunity to join the democratic ticket. Um, Kamala Harris will be running this fall alongside more than 120 other black women who are vying for seats in Congress this year. That is a number that dwarfs the record 48 uh, black women who ran some years ago. And so I call these women a force. Um, they are the inheritors of the vanguard, um, the women whose story I tell in this book. Um, and they are indeed going to lead this country in many ways. We know that they are not cookie cutters or figures are interchangeable, but one of the principles that they all exemplify is that that was articulated all the way back at the beginning of the 19th century, that neither race nor sex will arbitrate political rights, political power in the United States. And Senator Harris's um, nomination tonight is one important embodiment of that principle. Thank you so much, Professor Martha Jones. Uh, your book, Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All, will be available very, very shortly. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. This evening's event has been recorded
and it will be available here on the National Humanities Center's YouTube channel. If you would click the subscribe button and the notify bell below this video, you can be notified of any future discussions, other videos from the center. You may also visit the nationalhumanitiescenter.org website to learn more about the center's work and other opportunities to explore the humanities. I very much hope that this series on racial justice and injustice has inspired and informed you. I want to wish you a good evening. Please stay well, stay safe, vote, and make sure your vote counts. Good night.